Amen. Would you put your hands together and lift your voice for Jesus in the house? Come on, you ought to lift your voice a little higher than that. Add your voice with that clap. Come on, how many know the Lord is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we ask or even think? And he is in this house tonight. I don't know if you feel his presence. I don't know if you feel what's really happening in this room right now, but you ought to just respond to what you feel in the Holy Ghost. You are more than able. How many know? You are more than able. You are more than able. Do I have any testifiers in the building? You are more. Sing it with me. You are more than able. Would you lift your hands and would you just tell them, Lord, we know it tonight, say, you are more than able. Praise him in the household. Hey, you are more saved. Can do 
say that. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Come on, somebody just believe him for it tonight. Hey. Hallelujah. Anybody know that he's still in the miracle working business? Anybody still know that he's a miracle working God? And who am I to deny it? Who am I to deny it? Who am I? to deny it. Hey, who am I? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Who am I? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Who am I? Who am I to deny what the Lord can Oh, clap your hands to the Lord and just worship him. Hey. Hallelujah, hallelujah. One more time, would you just lift up a shout of praise in the building? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me just say what an honor it is for me to be in the Philippines. I have, amen. I have dreamed of being here, standing in this place, and I have desired to be here and to be with you all, and I am just so happy that it is here and that I'm here. I'm honored to be here tonight, and I give honor to your leadership, and I give honor to Brother Buckland, I give honor to all the, the men that I've been teamed up with this week, Brother McLaughlin, Brother Harvey, Brother Enzi, I'm so thankful to even be on the same team as these amazing and tremendous men of God. Um, I'll tell you what, I've never heard a district superintendent preach like that today. No, sir. You are blessed. Hear me, you're blessed. The Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. So if that is true, the exact opposite must also be true. That where there is vision, the people prosper. And so you ought to be thankful tonight that you're in a place that has vision. Because the vision of this house, the vision of this nation, the vision of this leadership will prosper your life. And I'm just honored to be here, honored to be in the house. I have been um, so impressed with your worship. I've been so impressed with your music. Thank you so much. You guys are unbelievable. Your talent, your gifting, your ability. Amen. I travel all over the world, and let me just tell you, you guys got it going on. Amen. You don't have to take that for face value. You can believe it or not, but you guys got it going on, and I am just honored to be a part of it. Amen. I believe I have a word tonight from the Lord. I would like to get quickly into the word of God. If you have your Bible tonight, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm going to read one verse, and that is verse 11. I thank God for the word that we have heard so far this week. Amazing words of wisdom, words of power, words of instruction. Let me just tell you that you have heard amazing word this week. And I know that this is the last service for the majority of you in the room. This is the last service for you. But let me tell you, Hebrews chapter 4 tells us this that they heard the same gospel as us, but it profited them nothing 
seeing that they did not mix it with faith. And let me just tell you today, just because you heard the word doesn't mean it's going to help you. Hear me tonight. Just because you heard the word doesn't mean it's going to help you. Oh, no. But if you take the word that you've heard this week home with you and you apply it to your life and you mix it with faith, something will happen in your life. Something will happen in your youth group. Something will happen in your church. Something will happen in your school. Something will happen in your family. Because the word that you heard this week is enough. Somebody shout enough. It's enough to take you from here all the way to heaven. But you got to mix it with faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, if you have it, just shout, I got it. Lest Satan, somebody say Satan. Y'all remember him? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant to his devices. Tonight, I want to preach to you on this subject, devices. The devices. Can we pray together? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what we feel in this room. We thank you for your power and your presence. I pray now that your word would do the work. I pray now that you would let your glory fall in this house. You would speak to us through your word. You would challenge us, change us, mature us, and grow us. I pray that we would not only be hearers of the word tonight, but that we would be doers of the word tonight. And we will be so careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that is due your holy and righteous name. And we pray in that name. Someone shout in Jesus' name. Come on, shout it again in Jesus' name. You may be seated in the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell them devices. If you have never read the book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, it is a difficult read, but it is a good book. The strategies that Sun Tzu would put forward in that book um, if you are connected to the military at all or you understand strategy, there's a lot of good strategy in that book The Sun, Sun Tzu wrote, The Art of War. There is a phrase in the book that Sun Tzu will say. He will say this, if you know your enemy but you do not know yourself, you have a 50-50 chance of victory. He said, if you know yourself, but you do not know your enemy, you have a 50-50 chance of victory. He said, but if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you have a 100% chance of victory. And what I believe tonight and what I will try to demonstrate to you is that we have become a church, we have become a movement that we have learned who we are. We are apostolic Pentecostal. We are baptized in Jesus' name. We are filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. We are a dancing generation. We are undefeated. We are unbeatable, unshakable, unmovable. We are worshipers. We know who we are. We've got a revelation of the mighty God in Christ, and we also have a revelation of the mighty God in us. We know who we are. But on the same flip of that coin, we do not know our enemy. We do not know him. We do not talk about him. He has become 
a fairy tale in the church. The greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing the church that he no longer existed and that we have uh, more power in our little, little pinky than he ever thought about having and that we shouldn't even worry about him anymore and we should just go on about our business and forget that there is an enemy roaming like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We have become ignorant to his devices, and we have lost the advantage. He has come like a thief in the night. His only desire is to kill, steal, and destroy. Paul would recognize this, and he said, take on yourself the whole armor of God. Why? Why do we need the armor? Why is the armor there? Why would we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, our loins girt about with truth. Why would we need an armor? Paul would tell us. This is a part of Ephesians chapter 6 that we forgot about. He said, put on the whole armor of God so you can withstand the wiles or the devices of the devil. We still have a devil to deal with. Man, I, I didn't expect you to run aisles right now, and that's fine, because this is unpopular preaching. It makes people feel kind of weird when we talk about the devil, and we say, well, we don't want to give him no glory. I'm not giving him any glory tonight. I'm exposing him tonight. I want to make you aware of his devices so that when you leave this place, he does not consume you and take away your gifting and take away your calling and take away your anointing and take away your ministry. I need to let a young man or a young lady in this room know the devil does not want to kill you. That's a lie. He does not want to kill you. He wants to ruin you. He wants to ruin your testimony. He wants to take away your confidence. He, wanna, he wants to take away your worship so that you cannot be everything that God called you to be. He will let you be a mediocre Christian for the rest of your life. But if he can keep you from walking into the ministry that God called you into, he's won his battle. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost here. Yeah. I want to tell you that the devil has many devices, and I'm not going to talk about all of them tonight, but I want to tell you that all through the Word of God, the enemy tries to mess with God's people. In 1 Chronicles, he provoked David to number Israel. In the book of Job, Satan told God himself, I am just roaming the earth looking for trouble. In Zechariah 3, Satan resisted the man of God. In Mark chapter 4, the writer will tell us that sometimes when the word of God, like a seed, falls by the wayside, Satan comes quickly and steals the fresh word of God that has been laid upon people's hearts. In Luke 13, Satan had a lady bound for 18 years. In Luke 22, Satan would enter into a disciple named Judas, and they would crucify Jesus when he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. In Acts chapter 5, Satan would enter the heart of Ananias, and Ananias would lie to the Holy Ghost and fall dead in the presence of Peter. 2 Chronicles chapter 11 will tell us this. Don't, don't, don't be misunderstood here. The Bible tells us that Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. 
Now, we forgot about these verses. We don't preach on these verses no more. We want to talk about Jesus and how good everything is and how awesome he is, and I believe in all that, and I'm down with all that. But you need to know when you leave this building, there's an enemy looking to take you out. There's a devil out there, and he wants to ruin your life and take away your anointing and take away your confidence in the presence of God. But I come today to remind him he's a liar, and the truth ain't in him. I came to remind you, and I came to remind the devil, he's a liar, and he ain't ever told the truth. He's the father of lies. Yeah. Satan buffets Paul. Satan hinders Paul. Satan gets in the way. Satan is moving throughout the earth. Even now, seeking whom he may devour. But I want to talk about a few devices that he has. The first device is the hermeneutical value of first. The first time we ever see Satan in the Bible, the first time we see him is in Genesis. And the first time that we hear his voice, he says this, Did God say? I want to tell you that the first device the enemy uses is he tries to lessen the power of the Word of God in your life. His first device is to come against God's Word in your life. He wants to confuse you about what God said. Hear me tonight. Because many of you, in the last couple of days, you have heard the voice of God. God has called you. God has given you power. God has given you strength. And when you walk out of these doors, one of the first things the devil's going to do is he's going to try to confuse you about what God said to you because he knows that the Word of God is the only thing that's going to keep you when you leave this building. Oh, I come to tell somebody, when the enemy comes in, he always tries to mess with what you believe about what God said. But God said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one spot of my word shall pass away. David said, Lord, your word is a lamp unto my path. It is a light unto my feet. It leads me and guides me. It was your word that I hid in my heart that I might not sin. It was your word. You notice that? It wasn't the shout. It wasn't the song. It wasn't God's presence. It wasn't all of that. No. The only thing that kept me from sinning was the word of God. Because you can shout and sin. You can dance and sin. You can worship and sin. But if you get in that word, that word will keep you from sinning. Bishop, we don't have a sin problem. We have a word problem. We need young men and young ladies that will get in the word of God and say, Lord, show me what I need to do. Show me how I need to walk. Show me how I need to talk. Show me how I need to live. Show me how I need to sacrifice. Show me how I need to grow in faith. Show me how to worship because it's already in the word. And the devil wants to confuse you about God's word. His device is to mess with the Word of God in your life. Because without the Word, you have no root. Without the Word, you have no root. We need the Word. Listen, what I'm about to say is profound. Go home and read your Bible. Read it from front to back, middle to front, middle to back. Read it over and over and over and over again. Write it on flashcards and memorize it. Listen, memorizing the Bible is not just for the Bible quizzers. I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Memorizing the Word of God is not just for the Bible quizzers. Every saint of God ought to be able to say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Every saint of God ought to be able to say, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
You need to know your Bible. You know why? I'll tell you why you need to know the word. Because there's devices. 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 If you, hear me, if you are getting your biblical connection from Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, you need to stop right now. If you're listening to online preachers but not listening to your pastor, you've made a mistake already. If you're listening to a TikTok preacher, you don't know where he's from. You don't know his credentials. He doesn't know you. He doesn't pray for you. He doesn't know your family. He doesn't know your calling. Why would you listen to that mess? Turn off the devices. If you like him so much, the next time you go to the hospital, call him and see if he'll come visit you. He ain't going to, but I know a man of God that'll show up at 3 a.m. in the morning. We need to get off our devices because the enemy uses devices. Oh, we got too many young people taking their cues from social media on what they believe. The devil is a lie. I go to the Word of God, and whatever God said about it, that's what I believe about it. Listen, hear me tonight. If you have never read the Bible, not only have you read it, but you understand the Bible, you have no business reading other religious books. Why? Why would you read a book about a book you ain't never read? The Bible is the standard. So that way when you read somebody else's book, and they're not writing the truth, you say, hey, the Bible didn't say that. Well, oh, well, Bishop, you know, these are smart people. They got degrees, and they've been to college, and they're professors, and they're, they're intelligent. And, you know, they, you know they, they're just so smart, and their books are just so amazing. I don't care what they said. If you don't know the Bible, you don't need to be reading their mess. You need to know what the Bible said about it before you find out what they said about it. What did God say about it? Because what God said about it is it. That's it, the bottom line. God has not changed his mind. God has not moved with the culture. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God hated it back then, God hates it right now. If he loved it back then, he loves it right now. The word never changes. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Be careful because the enemy wants to come against God's word. He wants to confuse you. Had a young man, you can be seated, had a young man come to me. He said, Pastor, what do you feel? about cessationism. Well, if you don't know what cessationism is, cessationism is making a rise. Cessationism is simply this. All tongues, Holy Ghost, miracles, signs and wonders ceased when the apostles died. And we don't speak in tongues no more and miracles don't happen anymore and there's no signs and there's no wonders and God's not moving, that's all fake. And, and all, that, all that has ceased. And he came to me and he said, what do you think about cessationism? I said, show me a scripture. Show, show me a scripture. I said, I, said, I don't, I, listen, if you can prove it to me by the word of God, I'm, I'm fine with it. I, I got no problem. If you can show me, just give me one scripture. 
He said, well, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it said tongues will cease. I said, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, it does. No, it don't. I said, matter of fact, I said, what is the, what is 1 Corinthians 13? What is that chapter? Tell me what the chapter is. He said, well, it's, I, I said, no, no, no. I said, see, you read one little part of a verse. Do not give me a slice of the bread and tell me it's the loaf. Mm -mm, don't do that. Don't give me a crumb and tell me you gave me the whole loaf. No, 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 no. I said, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. Love does not envy. Love does not, no, no strife. Love does not vaunt of itself. It does not puff itself up. It's all about love. He said in the beginning of it, he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and I don't have love, though I prophesy and don't have love, though I have a word of knowledge but I don't have love, I'm nothing but a sounding brass and a tickling cymbal. And at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, he says, now, listen to me, prophecy will cease. Knowledge will cease. Tongues will cease. Love is greater than these things. What he's saying is, is that when it comes to love, love is greater than prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. Who cares what you know? Who cares how you can prophesy? And who cares how much you can speak in tongues if you don't love one another? It doesn't matter. That's what Paul's saying. And I know that Paul wasn't saying that tongues cease because 1 Corinthians 14, the next chapter, Paul says, now, hold up. I speak in tongues more than all of y'all. Paul wasn't saying that tongues cease. You see, this is how easy it is for the devil to get you connected to his devices and you start losing your mind and thinking that this is not that. This is that. This is what the prophet Joel spoke about. We... We haven't ceased. God is still doing miracles. God is still pouring out the Holy Ghost. We're still speaking in tongues. The dead are still raised. The blind can still see. The lame can leap. The dead shall live again. We are still having miracles, signs, wonders, and the Holy Ghost. We got to be careful. Pay attention. The devil wants you. He wants to confuse you. He wants to mess you up. The second thing that the, the devil will use as a device is he'll come against the will of God in your life. I've noticed this as a pastor. The most common question that I get asked by young people in my church is this question. I don't know the will of God for my life. Pastor, oh, pastor, tell me what God's will is for me. I want to know what God wants me to do. I need to know God's will. Oh, please, if I just knew what God wanted me to do, I'd go do it. If I just knew what, what the Lord had called me to, I'd, I'd just go do it. And I always answer them by this because the Lord helped me with this when I was a young man. And I wanted to know what God's will was for my life. And the devil kept messing with me, telling me, you know, God, God hasn't called you. God hasn't given you a purpose. God hasn't given you a plan. You're just a nothing and a nobody. You'll never do anything. And I wanted to know exactly what God wanted me to do. The Lord showed me this. The Lord said, what did David do the day after he was anointed? David steps into the room with his brothers. The Bible says God speaks to Samuel, says that's him. Samuel goes over, the cork pops on his head, the oil pours on him, and Samuel gets up and leaves and goes to Ramah. What does David do on the next day? Now, the Bible's not very clear about this, but we do understand what David did the day after he was anointed. He did what he did the day before he was anointed. You know what he did? He went back out with the sheep and he did what the father had already asked him to do. I'm helping somebody right now. 
If you hear what I'm preaching to you right now, I'm going to help you. Because we want to know, oh, Lord, where do you want me to go? How do you want me to do it? What do you want me to do it? But you don't need anybody to prophesy to you tonight and tell you that you need to pray. You don't need anybody to prophesy to you and tell you you need to read your Bible. You need to fast. You need to study. You need to win a soul. You need to teach a Bible study. We all want to know what the end game is. But, Lord, just show me what I need to do tomorrow. David did not get a crown on day two. He did not kill a giant on day two. On day two, David went back out and continued to do everything the father had already asked him to do. And there's some young people in here, you are so frustrated. You are so mad because God has not spoken to you and told you everything that you're going to do. And so you have decided to be paralyzed, paralyzed in your worship, paralyzed in your giving, paralyzed in your sacrifice. And because you don't know everything, you don't want to do nothing. I'm going to say that again. Because you don't know everything, you don't want to do nothing, but the devil is lying to you. You ought to say, Lord, I don't know what I got to do 10 years from now, but I know tomorrow I got to wake up. I got to get in my word. I got to pray. I need to teach a Bible study. I need to fast. You know what would set your church on fire? If you would just do what you know you ought to do anyway. You ought to show up early and leave late. You ought to say, Pastor, what can I do? What can I clean? How can I work? I'm going to show up early. I'm going to be in the prayer room. I'm going to be in the front of the church worshiping God. I don't have to have a title. I don't need a name badge. I don't even need a license. I don't need a, I don't need a Bible school degree. I'm just going to say, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, I'm good with it. You ought to pray this prayer, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Let me be a part of it. I don't care if it's preaching the gospel or cleaning a toilet. It doesn't matter. I just want to be in your will. And whatever your will looks like is good with me. Uh, be seated. I got to hurry up. But you say, you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Chavis, that seems, it seems boring. I want a name badge. Can I get the VIP? Can I get the VIP? How do I, how do I become? And that's all we're worried about. And we have equated ministry to a microphone. And if we get the microphone, then we have really become something. And the devil's lying to you. That's, that's a lie from the devil. Because what the devil will make you do is sit in your seat and do nothing until you get a microphone. And you will miss your opportunity to grow in the Holy Ghost. You will miss your opportunity to develop the things that God wants you to develop. And because you can't preach, you won't worship. And because you can't sing, you won't teach Bible studies. And because you can't teach Bible school, you won't even reach your neighbor. The devil's lying to you. It's his device. You say, it's boring. Pastor Chavis just coming to church and just showing up and just, you know, serving on the usher board and parking cars. It's, it's boring. I want to do something. Well, let me tell you, for, for David it wasn't boring. Watch this. David stands in Saul's tent and he says, I want to go fight the giant. Saul says, you can't. You're just a kid. He has been killing people since he was a kid. You can't fight him. He will destroy you, boy. David lets us in on a secret that we didn't know. If it had not been for this moment, we would never have known. But David says, reluctantly, King, I got to tell you something. Come close. Come even closer. Closer. 
when I was watching my father's sheep, a bear came. C come closer. I killed the bear with my bare hands. You think it's boring, but God's developing you. You think just showing up is boring, but God's developing you. You think just praying when nobody sees it, God's just developing you. God's building a ministry in you, sir. God's building a ministry. Hey, when I was just watching my father's sheep, a lion came, and I killed the lion. And the same God, the same God that delivered me from the bear and from the lion, it's the same God that's going to deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. Where did David get his confidence? He got it when nobody was watching, when the cameras weren't rolling and the Instagram weren't playing, when nobody could see him. He was just by himself fighting lions and bears. Oh, my. So there's a 15-year-old boy in this room right now, and you've been fighting the devil since the day you were born. And one day, God's going to give you the stage to preach your message. But right now, you want to say, Lord, I want to be faithful, and don't let me grow weary in well-doing. Don't you let the devil lie to you. It's called, listen to me, it's called hell's herbicide. You know what a herbicide is? A herbicide is what they spray on plants. When they want to harvest cotton, they have airplanes fly over the cotton field and they release herbicide onto the cotton plant. And when the herbicide touches the leaf of the cotton plant, it starts a chemical reaction. And what the cotton plant does is the cotton plant over matures itself. It begins to grow, but it's not the season for it to grow. It begins to develop, but it's not the season to develop. So what it does, it grows itself to death and produces a little cotton ball on top so that it can be harvested out of season. And hell's herbicide, the device the enemy uses, is he sprays his herbicide on you, and you try to grow up before your season. And you grow yourself to death, so the devil can sift you as wheat. Oh, you ought not pray, Lord, let me grow up too fast. No, you ought to say, Lord, let me stay in my season. Let me stay in my season because I know I'm going to reap if I faint not. Lord, take me one step at a time because I don't want to get too far out here that the enemy will take me off my feet. Yeah. We called it getting too big for your britches. And there's a lot of young preachers today that are too big for their britches. They think God has put them there, but they put themselves there. The enemy whispered in their ear, you're bigger than your pastor. You can preach better than your pastor. The devil whispered in their ear, you don't need no license. You don't need to go before a board. The devil whispered in your ear, oh, you're too good for this church. This church doesn't see your potential. You ought to move across town. Hell's herbicide, the devices of the enemy. He'll let you stay in church and die on the vine. You will be the coin lost in the house. In the house and lost. I got a few minutes to finish this out. I want to tell you the last device. It comes against the word. 
He comes against God's will for your life. And then he comes against your worship. The devil wants your worship. Hear me tonight. Pastor Chavis, how do you know this? I know this because Satan had a moment to cultivate a temptation with Jesus. His development of the temptation went like this. Make these stones into bread. Use your ministry to feed yourself. Use your gifting for your own uplifting. Make this bread. Feed yourself with your ministry. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Word. Because he comes for the word. Then the devil says, okay, I'm going to take you to the temple. Take you up on the temple and... Uh, Throw yourself down, die, have the angels resurrect you so you can prove to everybody that you really are the Son of God. Show everybody you are who you say you are. The devil attempted to use Jesus' ego against him. He tried to get him to manifest his will before the time. Jesus was going to die, but the devil wanted him to die prematurely. He was going to die and resurrect, but the devil tried to get him to do it out of season. Oh, hear me. He come against the will of God. The devil knew that he was going to die, raise again. But he wanted him to do it out of season. Do it now. He said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't tempt him. Then he brings him up to a high place. And he shows him the kingdoms of the world. And he said, this is what you came for, right? You came for the world. Well, guess what? You're talking to the guy who owns the world. I own all this. This is all mine. You don't have to die. You don't have to bleed. You don't have to go to a cross. I will, if, I will give you all of this with no nails and no whip and no crown of thorns. I'll give you all of this. Everything you came for, I will give it to you if you worship me. Worship. It all comes back to worship. Jesus says this. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Because Jesus understood this, whatever you worship, you serve. Listen, I got about 10 minutes and I'm done. Music, you can kind of start getting ready. If you read Ezekiel, you will see that the devil is still anointed. Yeah. If you read it in Ezekiel, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, the gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Verse 14, thou art, you are. Before this, it was you were, you was, you used to be. But in verse 14, he says you are. The anointed cherub that covereth. Yeah. He's still anointed. That's why you got to be very careful what you let play in your ears. Okay. I got about 10 minutes. Y'all not going to like this. It's all right. Just, just hang on. 
the greatest device of the enemy today is the power of his gift. The power of his gift is, was, and has always been music. Hear me for just a moment because I got to move quickly. Just listen to me for right now. Just listen to me. Music is the only element on the planet that was not made here. Music is an alien life form. It is not from the world. Music was created in heaven. It was created by God. Listen to me. Music was created for one singular purpose. Worship. Listen to me. I don't got much time. So you cannot separate music from worship. It has one heavenly, singular purpose, worship. So if you listen to music about Jesus, you will worship Jesus. But if you listen to music about fornication, adultery, drug use, promiscuity, rebellion, witchcraft, I'm preaching right now. This is the best I've preached tonight, right now. Because the devil has put this generation in a trance with the music that they allow in their ears. We will listen to anything because we say, well, I don't listen to the lyrics, Brother McLaughlin. It's just the beat. Impossible scientifically impossible when music plays listen you are left brain and right brain your left brain is analytical solves problems understands if I say two plus two equals five everybody in the room that equation goes into your left brain left brain says you're wrong it's four and spits it out right brain is long-term memory it's where you learn it's where you develop it's creativity in your right brain that's why in America, I don't know how it is in the Philippines, but in America, every one of us learned our ABCs by singing them. A, B, C, D, E. You know why? Because when music is applied, when melody is applied, left brain activates and stays open. It does not analyze. And everything you hear goes into long-term memory. That's why you can sing a song that you don't even know that you know. But because you heard it in a restaurant two times, now you know the lyrics. Because your left brain was stuck open, and now you know the lyrics. Education understands this. The world understands this. So they put all kind of ungodly, rebellious witchcraft and promiscuity in their music. And when you listen to it, you're listening to the words and the music. And we wonder why half of our young boys are addicted to pornography. And we wonder why our young ladies are cutting themselves to make themselves feel alive. And we wonder why 15 and 14 year olds are on, on anxiety medicine. And we're sitting around here saying we don't know what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on. The devices of the enemy are sitting in your room right now with a secret passcode on it. The devices of the enemy are in your back pocket and you will put his earphones in your ear and listen to all that ungodly music that talks about everything under the sun. And then we come into this house and we struggle to worship and we struggle to lift our hands because you've been worshiping all week long. I told you, you're not going to like it. You was just shouting a minute ago. But you're not going to like this one. This one's hard because we want to be able to listen to what we want to listen to. Oh, I like that. I like him. I like them. Oh, he's cute. They're cool. Oh, it's K-pop. Yeah. 
They're not, listen, wait a minute, Pastor. They're not saying anything bad. Yes, they are. They're singing about love and romance, and you are neither married or about to get married. So all it's doing is conjuring up sexual ideas in your mind. I'm preaching to somebody. I don't know who it is. If you can't say amen, say oh me. Well, 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 Pastor Chavis, I don't listen to anything really bad. I don't listen to people cussing or all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but what are you listening to? What is it preaching to you? What are the words? Because the words, here's what you do. You go home. You download the lyrics. You don't play the music. You just read them out loud. And if you think God would be okay with you listening to that mess, but the music lets it in. The music opens the gate. This is what Nebuchadnezzar knew. Nebuchadnezzar said, I know all these Jews are not about to bow to this idol. So what I'm going to do to get these Jews to bow, I'm going to play music. Because I know the Jews respond to music. They're musical people. And so I'll play the music. And here's what he said. When you hear the sound of music, you bow down and you worship the idol. But there were three boys who could hear the words over the music. They said, hey, we know it sounds good. It even feels good. But we will worship the Lord and him only shall we serve. Be it known unto thee, O king, we will not bow down to thine image, neither will we serve your gods. Our God who is able will deliver us from thine hand. But if he don't, don't worry about it. We still not going to bow. Why? Because the enemy's devices, the enemy's devices are pushing. Here's what the enemy knows. Are you ready for this? The enemy wants to pervert music. You know why he wants to pervert music? Because he understands the power of music. He was there when he would sing and his pipes would bring forth the worship and God would come. And here's what he knew. If I can get the church corrupted in their music, they'll never be able to invite God's presence. But God said this in the book of Psalms. He said, I inhabit the praises of my people. I don't know if you know this or not. But that scripture, the word praise there, is not yada, it is not barak. That word praise in that scripture is tehillah. Do you know what the word tehillah means? It literally means the congregation singing a hymn. So here's what the, God, here's what the devil knows. If the congregation will ever sing together, God said, I'll come down in that. That's why he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst of them. If we can worship together, we bring the power of God up and we bring the kingdom of the devil down. The greatest mistake that the enemy made with Paul and Silas is he didn't separate them. He left them together. You made a mistake, devil, because if two or three are gathered together, and what did they do? The Bible says at midnight they lifted their voice and they sang praises. And when they began to sing, God came down. 
because all it takes is two or three. But I believe we got enough here tonight to tear down every device that the enemy's ever tried to build in your mind. Tear down every device that the enemy's tried to build in your heart. Tear down every device that the enemy's tried to build in your spirit. Lift your hands across this building right now and begin to lift your voice and begin to worship the Lord. Sing that out. Device has to fall at the feet of Jesus. Listen, I need you to be honest for just a moment. If you're in this room and the enemy has been operating his devices in your life, if he's come against God's word in your life, if he's come against God's will for your life, and if he has come against your worship right now in this moment, I believe that there is freedom that's going to come to this room. Listen. I know we have ministers all over this building. We have powerful men of God that can lay hands on you. I, I, but I know that we cannot get to all of you. So here's what I want you to do. If you've been struggling and the enemy has been using his devices on you, I want you to take your right hand and I want you to lay it on your head. And I'm going to pray a prayer of faith over you right now. And there is some young people that are about to be free from every device that the enemy wants to use against you. In the name of Jesus, by the authority of the Word of God, in the presence of the Almighty God, I come against every device. I come against every wile of the devil. I come against every fiery dart of the enemy. I come against every lie of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, be free now in the name that is above every name. Come on, pray. Pray. The chains are breaking right now. I feel the Holy Ghost here. Pray until you feel it break. Pray until you feel it break. Devil, you're a liar. Come on, tell him, devil, you're a liar. You will not take my ministry. You will not take my authority. You will not take my anointing. You will not break my calling. Hey. Satan, you're a liar. And the blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. Somebody begin to call on the name of Jesus. Come on.
on, pray for yourself right now. Call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus right now. I feel the Holy Ghost chains are breaking right now. There is a release in the building. There is a victory in the building. to lay hands on your neighbor and pray over them and say in the name of Jesus be free from every bondage be free from every lie be free speak the name of Jesus over them speak the name of Jesus over your brother speak the name of Jesus over your sister speak the name speak the name speak the name Satan, you're a liar. (laughs) Satan, you're defeated. (laughs) Satan, you're defeated. (laughs) Jesus is victorious. Something happens when I call your name. Something happens when I call your name. Something happens when I call.